My name is Austin. I'm going to be talking about actionable and interpretable predictions from a stack model. In particular, how to think about building a model based on business requirements. So to give some context, uh, I work at Halo Technologies and Halo Tech's mission <coughs> is accelerating adoption of medical advancements with evidence-based insights. So uh, the medical and biotech industries are incredibly important in the US. They represent a large percent of GDP and generally are good to help people's health. Uh, the way that we think that we can do this best, this acceleration, is by working with biotech and medtech manufacturers. So you can think of these as being DNA sequencers or other types of medical and biotech manufacturing. One of the reasons for this is because they spend 20 to 30 percent of their revenue just on selling, so that's in sales and marketing. That's a huge fraction of their income and of their uh, of these expenditures that they make. So if we can reduce this, then we can reduce the costs of providing healthcare all the way downstream, and we can also make this much faster. So if we are able to identify here are the people that a sales team should actually talk to to try to sell something, then we can make sure that uh, this, that new technologies that are being developed are actually being directed to the right people. So in particular, the way that we do this is by building data products. So we collect data from a variety of sources, do some aggregations and market landscape analysis, and then integrate this with our clients' data to make them more successful. In particular, uh, we get data from a variety of different sources. So we have a data ingestion platform so that we can get data from SEC filings, publications, clinical trials, various types of grants, and a slew of other sources. Each of these are either unstructured or semi-structured. A few of them actually do have some structure to them. So we've spent a lot of time actually uh, getting this into a system so that we can put everything into a useful structured format for our own purposes. A large part of that is involving entity resolution. Unfortunately, we have relatively weak signals as our keys, so instead of having something like an email address or a phone number, we have to rely on first name, last name, institution, year in many cases. For example, in a publication, we have the authors of that publication won't have any information about what their email address is, but we still need to be able to identify that Sally Smith at Stanford is the same person as Sally Smith at Stanford University Biology Department in some specific year. Uh, in addition to that, uh, since we're getting data from a variety of sources, uh, like publications and clinical trials, we need to be able to identify that this person who's publishing in an academic journal is the same person that's running this clinical trial. The reason for this is because we need this entire market landscape of anyone who would purchase from a biotech or medtech manufacturer. This is a small enough total population in the US that we aim to actually have a complete coverage. Uh, and then when we have client data that we join into this, we are able to have their customer list as a subset of the set of data that we have. Once we have uh, our entity solution, we figured out who actually uh, is the uh, contributors to these various types of data, we need to do some refinements on that. So this involves text analysis, feature construction, and a bunch of other types of uh, downstream uh, data aggregation, collection, or cleaning from the raw uh, data that we got from the, from the data ingestion. So a lot of the text analysis, for example, will be trying to figure out is this particular abstract relevant to this line of client products? And in addition to that, we will need to make sure it's not relevant for the wrong reasons. For example, uh, biostatisticians are probably not actually going to be purchasing a DNA sequencer, but we do need to know uh, if someone is a biostatistician uh, so that we can rule them out as a potential customer. So they might have a lot of the same types of words in their abstract because they want to do similar work, they're just taking a different sort of approach. 
So that's uh, sort of the data refinement. It is cleaning up the data that we already have. And this puts us, uh, this gets data available for us for various types of models. Uh, we have predictive and exploratory models for uh, the users at our, that our salespeople at our client companies. In this talk, I'm going to focus on an example of how to start with, a, with business requirements around a predictive model, and then how to build a simple model that actually achieves those goals. So in, in one example, uh, a salesperson needs to be able to achieve all three of these goals. Understanding each lead's work in the context of the client company. So that means that if we're looking at the, an academic segment, we need to know that some researcher is actually relevant to what our client's selling. In addition to that, if we have someone from a biotech uh, startup that does some genome analysis, for example, then we need to be able to know what type of work they're doing so that we can tell the salespeople what types of products would actually be relevant to them. And uh, after we're able to understand each lead's work in the context of our clients, we need to be able to find which are actually the high value leads, which people are going to spend money at our clients. And then once we have that, uh, the salespeople need to actually take some actions with these leads meaning that uh, there are different types of benefits that they can offer, such as some a discount or spending more time with this particular customer. Uh, so that could be looking at the amount of uh, phone calls or meetings in the past six months. So we're going to start with those three requirements, and we have several sources of data that we can work with to try to build a model that actually addresses these three goals. For example, uh, we if we want to look at just the total amount of spend for that finding the high value leads, we can start with customer spend data. So this might be how much money did each customer spend on each product over the past year uh, at, at this client's uh, company. So that might be the response variable that we're going to start with. And that's provided from uh, by the client. In addition, we have our full market landscape, which is built from the data that I spoke about earlier, uh, coming in from this data ingestion, and that we later clean up. So this is going to be a superset of the uh, a number of, uh, this is a superset of the uh, entities that were purchased from the client. So the some of the customer spend will have, will not match in here, because it'll, uh, it will just, that lead would not have actually spent any money at the client's company. So a uh, third piece of data that we have is salesperson actions. So this is uh, what actions did the salesperson take with that particular lead over the past some unit of time. So this, again, could be something like, uh, did they offer a discount? So uh, these three sources of data, the customer spend is our response information, uh, response feature. Uh, the full market landscape is the data that Halo Tech has that uh, is our market landscape. So this, and this is data that describes the customers, which is, extra, or which is uh, just characteristics of those customers. And we have salesperson actions, which are interactions between the salesperson and the customer. So in order to try to get at this first goal of understanding each lead's work in the context of the salesperson company, we can build a first layer of models just connecting the customer spend with the full market landscape. So that's training a model where the response variable is the customer spend and the explanatory features are the full market landscape data. So from here we can build an opportunity table. And we can then actually achieve this goal of having, uh, of figuring out what the leads work is in the context of the client company by looking at, for example, the local importances in this opportunity model. So if we just have a random forest for that opportunity model, then there are standard methods like local importances so that you can figure out what are the relevant features on a per prediction basis in that model. So that allows us to achieve this first goal. 
from there, we can take the output from that opportunity model and take the negative residuals, so that is the predicted minus the observed values, because that represents an opportunity that the salesperson can actually go out, go out after. Uh, because if we think that this particular lead has an opportunity to spend a million dollars with the client, but they're actually only spending 800,000, then that represents a $200,000 difference that we would expect to be available that this customer's uh, characteristics, like how much money they have raised in grant funding, or the, types, the type of research that they have published on, various other features, suggest that there is uh, more opportunity that is actually being achieved by the salespeople at this time. So we can take that negative residual from the opportunity model and build another layer of model using that as the response variable and using the salesperson actions as the explanatory features. So when we do that, uh, we get some predictions of uh, what, which are actually the values that salespeople can get by going after these individual leads. Because we're predicting, uh, we don't want to just predict that difference in predicted minus observed in the opportunity model. We also need to know that that is explainable by salesperson actions. So if, uh, if we have a, uh, a, high prediction, a high predicted value in that action model, then we expect that there are actions that a salesperson can take that will actually lead to a higher amount of spend. And using the same trick as before in the opportunity model, we can look at if we decide to make this another random forest, because that has nice properties of explainability, then we can again look at the local importances in that action model. So here we will get various features that say that for this particular lead, the features that were most important were did this lead receive a discount offer in the past six months? And then the next most important feature might be how many times did this lead get reached out to by a salesperson in the past year? So by looking at the local importances, we're able to see what actually are the features, so what are the actions that a salesperson could take that would be most explainable in the model to try to drive a sales forward. So the point of this is uh, that we can address business needs with standard tools just used in novel ways. So in this particular example, uh, I used a couple of different tricks. Uh, the models were stacked where each layer in the stack had different explanatory variables where the first layer was characteristics of the actual customers that we were trying to make predictions for. And the second layer was features which are based on interactions between that lead and the sales team. So by having these different layers of uh, models which have very different features, we're able to pinpoint out the different reasons why a salesperson might want to reach out and then also what actions should be taken. So also, uh, at each layer in the model, we're leveraging uh, the individual model types to achieve the business goals. So uh, two of the business goals that we were initially given involved make some, uh, something explainable. We need to be able to tell a client why about something. So uh, because random forests have this uh, nice local importances built into them, uh, then you can use that to answer those questions. So, uh, a couple things to be careful of when you're doing something novel like this by just building a stacked model instead of using something just off the shelf, uh, you need to be extra careful to avoid some pitfalls. So, uh, inf uh, one example is information leakage. In this case, um, because all of the features in that first model were characteristics of the leads themselves, uh, that is not going to be 
very problematic in having this two-layer ensemble. In that second layer, you can imagine that some, some salespeople would be more likely to reach out to very large institutions. So reach out to, for example, a Stanford biology department, um, as opposed to uh, focusing on the ones that we thought uh, that we thought were most relevant. Uh, it looks like it's back now. Thanks. Um, another issue is outlier effects. So if you have a first layer in your model, which is very bad at extrapolation, and you need to make extrapolations, then having that feed into a second model is going to cause problems. Again, uh, by having these two layers, you need to worry about bias variance trade-offs, not only in the whole ensemble, but at each layer. So uh, there are, I'm sure, a slew of other things that you need to be very careful about when you're building your own like this. But I think that uh, this is something that, uh, just as a, an example in this talk, has been working through starting with business requirements and then actually building a model that addresses them one by one like this. So I hope that you were able to get something out of that. And I am open to questions now. Start it off. Um, did you? Is this on? Okay, great. Uh, I didn't hear the word causality. I don't think, but it seems like you're uh, thinking a lot about uh, causal issues. Uh, do you, is there any path forward for these things to sort of introduce uh, counterfactual reasoning or uh, causal interventions like that sort of stuff? So for a relatively short talk, I am glossing over plenty of the details, as you can imagine. Uh, the, uh, we don't need to address causality directly for this particular use case, because uh, from these requirements, we just need to uh, like understand the, the lead's work in the context of the salesperson's company. So there's no causality that is required there. We just need to have a case so that when a salesperson picks up the phone to call someone, they know instantly what type of person they're talking to. Uh, and similarly, in what types of actions to take, uh, we do not need to have uh, causality here. Uh, that would be very, very nice if we did have that. Uh, but again, we are just making recommendations. These, uh, when we have a, so any company that has a sales team is almost by definition, selling something expensive. Otherwise, it would just all be done through marketing. Because of that, we are going to rely very heavily on the sales team to make good decisions. So we are providing recommendations about the actions to take. By giving them the additional context of why that lead is relevant to their company, we expect them to be able to understand what are the, the rules for that company, and are they, uh, do they feel empowered to give them a discount. Maybe not if it is uh, a, uh, a new prospect, someone that's not already a current customer. Whereas they might be willing to uh, take some actions which are get on the phone more often. Uh, because then that's something that doesn't cost the company anything. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Actually, I actually have two questions. Can you um, tell us or talk to us about how you're capturing the interactions between the salespeople and the customers? And then also, can you talk to us about the journey of getting adoption on the sales, um, sales so the, the salespeople? Mm -hmm. uh, so the salesperson activity, uh, so our product integrates with Salesforce. So our, client, our clients will connect Salesforce to our app, and then we pull in all of that information. We also allow clients to uh, integrate their Exchange or Gmail email services so that we can uh, see uh, email exchanges over time between the client and customers. Uh, and that also includes calendar, uh, if that comes through Exchange or through Google, uh, so we can see when that actually sh when uh, meetings actually took place on the uh, user at the client's company, uh, when it, that took place on their calendar. 
So uh, this is all being pulled in without the client company doing anything to provide that except to expose the Salesforce API. And then about your second question, uh, driving adoption, um, uh, we have had, uh, as you might expect, different levels of uh, eagerness to adopt our product. New salespeople are absolutely thrilled about what we're providing because it gives them a way to get jump started immediately and start performing at the same level as people who have well established entrenched networks. And for people that have uh, those deep networks already, uh, we're giving them an opportunity to understand uh, where they could be spending their time most effectively. So it's uh, different levels of adoption, primarily based on uh, salesperson experience. 